It's time to tour Willwood. So you guys have seen what we make. You want to see how we make it? Banks built, protected by Amsoil. With support from Roadster Shop and Nitto. Hi, I'm Gail Banks. Like and subscribe for weekly episodes of engineering, education, and entertainment. All right, let's do this. So, uh, dinos, this is not a normal dino cell. No, this is a dino that Bill built, Bill Wood, probably 30 years ago. But it's something that we still use today. Now, we don't use it for gathering as much data as we used to. What we do is we use it for burnishing the rotors and brake pads together. In a race application, you got to make sure that your driver gets to that racetrack and the car is ready. You don't get there with an engine that needs to be dynoed, right? It's already dynoed. It already is ready for him to put laps on. Well, it's the same thing with the brake system. So what we do is we'll bed or burnish a set of brake pads to a rotor. Break them in, match them up. Exactly. So they're bedded before they get to the track. So it's either for racing or for any kind of testing. Saturating a brake pad and getting it all set up so that it's ready to run, you can't drive a race car up and down the street and bed your brakes in. Right, yeah. Right? So it's all these kind of things that we've been doing for a long time and it, it, it's a pretty big piece of our business. Tell me about this uh, flywheel. I know, it's crazy, <laughs> right? So if I come over to it, it's, it's basically showing you the inertia of a vehicle. So you're, you're talking like, you know, a stock car is, is what this was really designed based around. So um, 3,200 to 3,500 pound car um, with all that inertia runs off of natural gas. Oh, it runs off gas. natural gas. Oh, okay. And it even has to get smog tested. <laughs> <laughs> smog hog. Literally. <laughs> That's how you know it's in California. Dude, it's a good wrench 350. Come no on way. now. This is the engine in lockjaw. It's the same, same exhaust manifolds. Same exhaust manifolds. <laughs> it will, we'll give you the, uh, the Edelbrock intake for this once we're done with it. Yeah, so when this thing's running, you hear it. You know. Okay, so this is the Link Dyno. This is the state-of-the-art dyno that we do all of our dyno testing with, all the way from um, our OEM military platforms and the reason I bring that up is some of those things weigh 30,000 pounds. Well, this is all electric driven with motors. I believe it's two motors together. So you can run one or both. And then there's plates that simulate the inertia. So we can bolt the plates together to give you that weight. It's a modular system to just suit your needs, what you need for that test. Totally. So we can do it all the way from a 2,000 pound car all the way up to a 30,000 pound vehicle. And sometimes that's what we're doing is because we'll even um, build brakes that go on trailers for military applications. Ah. So it's the entire system, not just a vehicle. And this thing is crazy because that dyno, mm -hmm. you hear it run. This one, we can have a conversation like this. That's all it, you just, you'll feel the ground rumble sometimes, <laughs> but you can have a conversation like this and it's just spitting sparks out of it. So where, where are we looking? Where would the, the brake rotor be? The rotor would be bolted onto this backside. Okay. And then the caliper is bolted on here. Okay, got it. Oh, I see the mount over here. Okay. Yep. <laughs> here we go. So the, the owner, Bill Wood, has a, a big heart for Miatas. And right now, I think he owns four of them, two race cars and two street cars. Um, and then even the street car has got a 3.7 V6 Chevy engine in it. <laughs> so, this, is, this is this champ car or chump car racing car. And then we have another car that's kind of the backup, but some weekends when they go race, they run both. A lot of telemetry in here. And this also is one of the test beds for us doing some different uh, brake testing, including ABS stuff. This particular area, there's no production done. It's just for R&D. We make all the tooling ourselves. So if we have an engineer that designs a new caliper and then we need to make the tooling for the caliper, it's all done here. So the same engineer is also designing the tooling for it. 
So there's, there's not a lot of interruptions on getting stuff done properly and correct so that when it goes out to the big machine shop, everything runs smooth. A lot of similarities there. You know, that's what Eric does. He's a prototype engineer on the mechanical side. Then we do the same thing where we'll build the fixturing for our circuit boards. We build the fixturing for even the, the plastic molded pieces like the iDash, the plastic housing. Oh yeah. We do all of that in-house. Very similar styles. And I, and I can tell watching a lot of your guys' videos that I think the culture is very similar. And I think that Gail and Bill Wood come from a very similar background in the way that they think and the way that they manufacture. So this is a CMM machine. And what it's doing is measuring parts that we've manufactured in-house or when we bring in raw goods or finished goods like brake pads, mm -hmm. they'll do all the measuring in this during the quality control process to make sure that they're to spec. This is where we do most of the caliper manufacturing along with master cylinders, rotors, but these machines behind us do most of this. So we start with a net forging. This is right out of the forge. This is the, the raw net forge right yep, here. This is the raw. And then we take our tooling, machine it. It's also deburdened the same area. Then it'll go to the other building and get hard anodized. It's pretty dense for an aluminum piece. Now remember, once we machine it, probably 40% of the, of the mass goes away. Right. And so what's going on behind us? So most of these machines are running two shifts, six days a week. It's a lot of manufacturing. Yeah. So here's one of our race rotors, directional vane. But something I think you'll like, Eric, is we cast it with a flange on both sides. So we can machine them into left or right hand rotors. Ah, uh, okay. So it's the same casting for our left or right hand side. We just machine this flange off depending on what side it is. No kidding. So these forgings right here? Correct. Against the finish, oh my God. So this is gonna be a net forging that we make. This bolt circle will accommodate a 12 on eight and three quarter bolt pattern. And then we machine a bunch of different rotor or hats out of this one particular forging. Just a universal blank. Yep. You gotta feel the difference there. <laughs> wow. I mean, you, you have taken out, you've removed so much material. Yep. But way stronger than a billet and less waste than a billet. A lot of pros to manufacturing this way. And because we manufacture so many using the same blank, we can get the cost down. Yeah, just get a ton of them. We start with one forging blank, and then we machine quite a few different hat assemblies. This particular one is for one of our rear passenger car internal drum brake kits. Where are you doing the forgings? A multitude of places. Oh, you are. Okay. Yeah. You don't, that's not something you do in house. No, here in house, we don't do that. But everything, probably the five different places that we get all of our forgings from, they're all places that do nothing but our stuff. I see. So here's another big part of our business is doing a lot of hub assemblies for all the brake kits we manufacture. We start with this net forging. So you're, you're tripping out on the weight. So feel this, we have a large flange, a decent length snout, and a lot of offset here so we can machine a lot of variants, right? Okay. So here would be a finished tub. So what's cool about these machines is we used to have probably five operations and it took like two machines. Now it's one machine with two operations. Okay. So they do the lathe and the mill work on each side. So it's only two steps instead of four or five. You're doing the threads as well? All of it. Wow. Wow. Crazy, right? So we brought in anodizing in-house a few years back and it's because lead times were getting longer, quality was going down. By bringing it here, we're able to really monitor the process and make sure that we're coming out with a better quality part. And what's really cool about it is we're now giving even our street customers, like the calipers we're gonna be using on the project, mm -hmm. 
the same exact finish and process as our full-blown race stuff. So you're getting the best of both worlds by us bringing it in-house and getting the quality up. And the other thing that I like about it is we made a whole new division. We hired a lot more people. And you get to work with OSHA that much more closely. Not me. <laughs> <laughs> so what was the mindset on choosing hard anodizing over like a typical type two anodized? Is it just durability or? Wear characteristics and durability. Um, we, there's a video you can watch that our lead engineer that runs this department made that explains the big difference between type two and type three anodizing and why hard anodizing is so much better and it makes the parts so much better. So the main thing with anodizing is corrosion resistance, correct? Corrosion resistance and wear, because you've got like the piston in the bore, mm -hmm. so it, it has wear, less wear characteristics than type two regular anodized. So the, the tolerances in the bore, is that accounted for? Yes. Once, so you, you, Those the, things had to be changed. The thickness of the anodizing was, is, it's prepared yep. pre -in. Okay. Yep. So alkaline cleaner, water rinse, acid etch, water rinse, sulfuric anodized, don't put your arms in there. Another sulfuric anodized, another water rinse. They're all different stages that it takes for doing this process. When these are running, you'll notice that these are doing all the work. Um, and when they come out, they've got the coating on them. So after this, they come through this rinse process, they're dried off and they're ready to be used for a caliper. This is yep. an insulation on this particular tank. Tank six sulfuric anodized operating temp for type three, 28 to 32 degrees Fahrenheit. We've got sulfuric acid at 12 to 15%, DI water deionized uh, 88 to 85%. Dissolved aluminum, less than 15 grams per liter, I'm guessing GL. And then uh, do not ingest it, do not touch it, stay far away, is what I'm getting at with there. And here's another trippy okay. thing. This is aluminum, but everything that the calipers are bolted to is right. titanium. So all the fixtures are titanium because they're non-ferrous. Non so all the plates that you see that get submerged into the bath, mm -hmm. it's all titanium, all the nuts and bolts, all the washers, everything. Non-ferrous material, right. So I saw the finished gray parts. It's hard anodizing, completely undyed, so it'll come out the kind of neutral gray. Yes, so that's the natural color. Right. And it, it, it was hard for me to get used to that. Like, this is the natural color. I'm like, but it's colored, right? But if we got really in depth about how the process is done and how it goes into layers, that's why it has a color to it. All right, so this is the e-coat area. So the rotors that we're gonna be putting on the truck, we e-coat them. And what that does is it gets down into all the veins and it would be the same as like, you see a lot of rotors that get zinc coated, but what, what we found with zinc coat is when they get to a certain temperature, the zinc coat gets so hot that it chalks up and then it doesn't do anything for the corrosive inhibitors, right? Yeah. It just kind of burns up. E-coat is water-based paint. So when you buy a fender for your car, an aftermarket fender, and it comes black, that's E-coat. So by doing this, it gets down in the veins better and it's better for longevity of not getting any rust or anything on the rotor. So the rotors on the truck will be this way, then the annulus or that part where the brake pad rides, it'll, it'll clear it off for that spot. So we do steel on one side, and then we do aluminum on the other side. The tank he's about to put it into is the E-coat. And you'll see that he moves it around, gets all the air out of it. And then that, that long rod, that gives it the electrical charge. And now it's being E-coated. This is the assembly area. Everything that's assembled, packaged, and sent to shipping is done right here. So everything in my Willwood box was put together by these guys. Absolutely. Thank you guys. They're not paying attention. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. So hold on. you've got a silkscreen press for putting the Willwood logo on here? Yeah, it's the way we've been doing it a long time. Two at a time, it's like 
old school t-shirt style. Absolutely, and then after this process, we take that caliper and bake it in the oven again. I can't believe it's, it's so old school for such a high-tech engineering company. But we do some new school stuff, and that's our laser engraving. I can show you that over here. All right, Jay, after we put our name on it, the caliper's done. This is what we're gonna be putting on the truck. Looks a little small, don't you think? Yeah, that's what she said. <laughs> In the next episode, Gail unboxes our new Roadster Shop chassis. I see you. Hi guys, Gail Banks here. I hope you're enjoying the show. If you've got any ideas on how we might improve this rust bucket, be sure and put them in the comments below.